Sidney Perkowitz, welcome to the program. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. Sidney Perkowitz is the Professor Emeritus of Physics at Emory University. Sidney has written for several publications, including the LA Times, the Washington Post, and the Encyclopedia Britannica. He's appeared on CNN, the BBC, and lectured at the Smithsonian Institution and the NASA Space Flight Center. He's the author of Empire of Light, Universal Foam, which is one of my favorite all-time books, Wow. Digital People, Hollywood Science, and his latest book, Slow Light, Invisibility, Teleportation, and Other Mysteries of Light. Uh, Sydney, now I'm not calling you an idiot, Professor, but your title is an oxymoron. How can light be slow? And that's why we put it in the title. We hoped it would generate people's curiosity. If there's one thing people know about light as a basic piece of scientific fact, the factoid is that it's fast. So we went with the paradox. But how can you make light slow? It's a hard thing to do, and the woman who did it, she's a Danish physicist named Lena Howe, uh, H-A-U, I think is the right spelling, did it 10 or 12 years ago, got absolutely front-page worldwide headlines when she did it. What people maybe don't know about light is, yes, it's fast, but it's at its fastest when it's going through vacuum. If you run it through anything that's transparent, glass, water, whatever, it slows down. It's still very fast, but not quite at the ultimate speed. Professor Howe, who was working at Harvard at the time, found a medium through which you could send light that slowed it down really a huge amount, about the speed of a racing bicycle rider, 30, 40 miles an hour. So it was a matter of finding the right substance for it to travel through. That stole a lot of energy from the light, and that slowed it down. But it was a hard thing to do. It was a world-class experiment when she first did it. And what are the implications of this experiment? What could this accomplish? Of course, one part is just kind of the gee whiz aspect. I always thought light, fa uh, light was fast, and darn, now I know it's slow, so that was a part of it, fundamental research. But there's a lot of possible application. There's a big movement these days to take the technology that we all depend on, which is electronic technology, which has been around for 100 years, and see if we can update it by using particles of light, photons instead of particles of electricity, electrons. So instead of what is now called electronics, people are starting to talk about photonics, light-based technology. And this ability to slow down light is one of the kinds of control you would need to do to have light do the same things that electricity does now. For instance, use light in computers, use light to store data, and so on. So is a contribution to technology as well as to basic science when the speed of light was slowed down to the level that I said. Can anything travel faster than the speed of light? Uh, nothing that carries information. You, you can think about situations where something seems to be traveling fast than the speed of light, but when you analyze it, you find that nothing is really being transported in any meaningful way. You're not transporting energy or matter or data or information. So, so the short answer is no. To the best of our knowledge, nothing meaningful, meaningful can travel faster than the speed of light. You can talk metaphorically. You, know, you might say a thought forms at greater than the speed of light, but that doesn't really have quite the same physical meaning. So I'd say the answer still is no. As far as we know, the speed of light is the speed limit. If the speed of light is the speed of time, by slowing light down, does that slow time down? Yes, this is built into Einstein's relativity. I wouldn't quite put it that way. I wouldn't make quite that direct a connection that slowing down light means you've slowed down time. But there is some relationship because the speed of light is a big factor in the way Einstein thought about relativity. And one of the things that comes out of relativity is there are situations where if you have two different people, Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones, depending on how fast they're moving relative to each other, time moves differently for the two people. So one of them might age faster, one of them might age slower. So yeah, there are things related to the speed of light that would let you think about the fact that time moves at different rates. It's one of the intriguing things about relativity that makes it so very hard to grasp because it's so outside our usual experience. And that's what makes Einstein such a genius. Yes, he had the ability, I mean, talk about thinking outside the box. He had the ability to think outside absolutely everything that was known about physics at the time. This was the early 20th century, and come up with an entirely different way of looking at things. 
it has hardly ever been matched. I think you'd have to put him up there among the two or three greatest scientists of all time. Have you seen Star Trek IV? No. I've seen uh, just about every other thing, but not that. The one with the whales, as they call it. Uh, they, at one point, slingshot around the sun, and they use it to travel back in time. I'd forgotten that. That's right, and they scoop up some whales, right? That's right. Yes, so I have seen it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that possible? Uh, okay, I think there are a couple of different uh, work, working parts in what you said. So slingshotting around the sun, yeah, that can be done. In fact, NASA does that right now when it sends out satellites as a tech, uh, or rocket ships or space probes. There's a technique where they slingshot them around the planet, and that actually helps them build up speed. So that part could work. Going back in time, well, again, if you go back to the theory of relativity, it seems like the math says that might be possible. Now, this is just math. It, it's not actually been done in a lab or anything like that. It seems like the math says that might be possible, and yet this is where philosophy comes in. It turns out if you could do that, you would set up such weird paradoxes like going back and murdering your own grandfather, and therefore would you exist, you set up such weird paradoxes that most people come down to the opinion, no matter what the man says, this is never going to happen. So right now the answer is a pretty strong no. As Hawking says, if time travel were possible, where are all the visitors from the future? And isn't that a great way to look at it? Uh, I mean, he put in one sentence what one of the objections is, and that goes right along with if there are other alien intelligence out there, why haven't we seen any of them? So the, those two ideas are kind of linked in that way. Where, where's the evidence? We'd all like time travel to be possible. I mean, it's made some of the greatest science fiction ever, but it doesn't look remotely possible at the moment. Well, it's a plot device. And that's important. You, you need at least one good plot device to make a lot of good science fiction happen. You couldn't have anything at all uh, in the Star Trek series or the Star Wars series or any other, whatever your favorite series is, if you couldn't allow spacecraft to travel faster than light. Because otherwise it would take so long to get from point A to point B in the universe, all the TV viewers would fall asleep by the time any action ever happened. Well, the Alien series, they got around that by putting him to hypersleep. Right, and, and that's another great plot device. And I've actually been at conferences about space travel where people have started to talk seriously, would this really be possible to do? Could you put someone in a, in a sleep state or a coma for a year or two years or ten years and have them wake up at a distant star? I don't think our, our biomedicine is there yet, but I don't think people would rule out that possibility at all. What are lasers? I understand they have something to do with light, but uh, what are they and why are they hot? I guess the simplest way to say it is the laser is a way of concentrating light that we didn't know how to do before 1960. That's the year that were invented. Compared to the average light source, incandescent light bulb or a fluorescent the desk lamp, you get a much more um, energetic beam of light, much more focused, and also, this is a little bit of a technical word, but I think it can explain it, also coherent which means all the light waves in that beam are an exact step with each other. And that makes a difference, for instance, it lets you analyze what the light is shining on much more carefully than if you just use light from an ordinary light bulb. So all those advantages have made lasers, you know, just about ubiquitous. There's no place you can go anymore where you don't see them. I saw an ad yesterday for uh, a little gadget that uh, removes trimmed leg hair uh, that is said to use lasers. This is something you can now buy for 50 bucks. I found it unbelievable, and I really would like to see the laser in it. Is this the no-no uh, razor, you mean? It, it, it's a little roll-on razor, but it doesn't have any mechanical cutting. It has a little laser in it. I've heard they're not very good. Well, I'm not surprised, because I don't... It, if you didn't want this to be very dangerous, you would have to put a pretty puny laser in there, and I can't believe that would be very effective. Yeah, no, I've heard that they're damaging to your skin after a while. Doesn't surprise me either. So I think, I think Russell, you and I are doing a public service now. There's probably not a good thing to use a lot of. And I'm probably going to get sued. That's okay. Yeah, me too.
In the 80s, they had the Star Wars project, right? The, the movie was so successful, they decided to make a project around it. You mean uh, uh, President Reagan's Star Wars project, right? Right. And they had lasers. I think that was the idea, that they could just laser beam the Kremlin, and that would be it. Yeah. And uh, that's part of the reason that the project never got anywhere. There were issues with the space vehicles, but there were also issues with the lasers, because these weren't just any lasers. The laser that you and I see in the supermarket has, a, again, a relatively puny little red beam coming out. Even if it hit you in the eye, chances are it would not do serious damage. The lasers they wanted to use for the Star Wars initiative would have been X-ray lasers. X-rays are much more powerful than ordinary light. If you put them in a laser, it would be a truly horrendous weapon. But they never were able to make a workable X-ray laser. I think to this day, no one has made a truly practical, workable X-ray laser. So that's part of the reason the whole scheme fell apart. So any spectrum of light can be used to create a laser? Yes, with some limitations, but there are ultraviolet lasers and visible light lasers of any color and infrared lasers. Uh, I've had uh, some of each of them in my own lab, and, and a lot of them are in common use. I don't mean you see them in the supermarket necessarily, but you can buy these off the shelf for different kinds of scientific applications. There are red lasers and blue lasers and so on and so forth. It's a huge range, but x-rays, not yet. They were talking about the Star Wars project, I remember, on RoboCop. Have you seen that, the new RoboCop? I haven't seen the new one. I'm afraid it'll be disappointing, but I'll put it on my list. I love the old one. Listen, it's going to be another public service announcement. Don't go see the new RoboCop. <laughs> uh, they spent $120 million on this, and I have no idea why. It was bad. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. No, it was really bad. I took my son there, and I was very disappointed, but the original was great. The reality of, of creating a RoboCop-type suit, is that something that we could see possibly happening? I think a lot of that is possible. A lot, of, a lot of it, or at least some of it, is in the works. Some of it in unexpected ways. For instance, um, war generally has only bad, bad outcomes, but sometimes it has some good spin-offs. So in the U.S. involvement in Iran and Iraq, a lot of our troops had limb injuries because they wear a body armor which protects the torso, but when they hit an explosive device, that would damage or take out arms and legs. So the U.S. Defense Department has put a lot of money into prosthetic limbs, into improving them. If you get a good prosthetic limb, by which I mean a mechanical replacement for an arm or a leg, you're kind of halfway toward building a whole body suit that has motors and therefore makes you strong, maybe even stronger than a real human being would be. So there's been a lot of work done along these lines. Uh, of course, you never know what military research is doing that we don't know about. As far as I know, we're, we're certainly not there yet. But there are a lot of converging kinds of technologies that I think might make this quite possible in some number of years, less than a century, maybe less than 50 years. I think it's not out of the question at all. Much of your research has been government-funded, is that right? Yes. M m most American scientists get, uh, academic scientists anyway, get most of their money from various arms of the U.S. government. Does that mean in any way that you have an agenda or are expected to reach certain conclusions? It used to be not, not so. The, the, uh, the research agencies, some of them are purely about basic research, like National Institutes of Health. And clearly, that's going to end up helping human welfare, or at least that's the goal. But even the military ones, that you can get money from the U.S. Navy or Army or Air Force. Even the military ones were wise enough to understand that if they gave the researchers a free hand, it might end up with good results for them. But meanwhile, the researcher is also doing good science. But in the last few years, the money is cut back. There's a little more emphasis on research with a directed goal. So the question you just asked, I think the answer is it used to be great. It was really pretty wide open. Now it's a little more constricted. That's not good. It's not good. And, and it goes along with issues about economics and where a country wants to put its money and whether it thinks it can do what it needs to with taxes, does it need to raise taxes, lower taxes, and so on. So it gets into the whole political scene here in the States in a lot of different ways. In the movie RoboCop, I, I believe the uh, Detroit police force was a corporately run 
Please force. That movie was really far-sighted because they, it, it saw what we're beginning to see now in reality. Exactly. And if you watch that 80s version, it's incredibly prophetic. Yeah. The director is Paul Verhoeven, who's known for taking kind of a sideways view with society. And even when he makes a movie that is just supposed to be pure sci-fi entertainment, he really sneaks in some social commentary. And he managed to do it very well in that film, I thought. Can you envision a society where we have corporate police forces, robocops? Yeah, yes, I, I, I wouldn't say it's at the point where I lie awake worrying about it yet, but I, I see trends. So one trend is, and a lot of people have commented on this, this is not by any means original to me. The people who do comment on it know a lot more about it than I do. But many people are seeing that uh, partly as a result of uh, issues with terrorism, which is a serious issue, police force is becoming more militarized. So you never heard of police force years ago having a track vehicle like a tank that could break into a house. Now you do. Now you see SWAT teams uh, with heavy armor with automatic weapons and so on. So if that trend continues, I certainly could see whatever the military is doing somehow spreading out a little bit into what the civic police forces are doing and then you often running in a certain direction, which to me is not a very happy direction. The other clue is, okay, we haven't privatized police forces yet, but we certainly have privatized prisons in the U.S. Uh, that this become a huge industry, although it's not exactly policing in the streets of the city. It's a related area, so again, I see signs that it could change. I think we're very distant from that yet. I think people would have real problems with it, but I think it's a little more possible than it was, let's say, 20 years ago. If you ever watch old science fiction movies, they're always way off on the time scale. You know, Jetsons and uh, flying cars and whatnot. But uh, how far away is, say, an iRobot type of society where there are androids living among us? I think we're doing well on the mechanical part of robots. They can walk pretty well. I've seen videos of robots that can make it over obstacles and so on. The point is something that looks like independent judgment even within guidelines, is still a long way off. My son is actually in the AI business. He has a PhD in that area. So I, I keep abreast a little bit. And um, there's a long-standing joke about AI, which he, which he buys into, too. The joke is artificial intelligence is 20 years away from us, and it always will be. So getting to the point where you really can build something artificial that even has the skills of a five-year-old child let alone a full adult, is distant and maybe not achievable, maybe not achievable at all. At least we need to know a lot more about the brain than we do now, and we're pretty ignorant there. You know, if, if you're a, a scientist, or, or maybe it would be better to say a science fan, that is, if you follow what's hot in science, the word neuro pops up everywhere these days. It is the hottest area, and there's huge progress being made. But it also shows you, if you dig, dig into it a little bit, how much more needs to be done. We really do not understand all that much about the brain as a functioning uh, organism. And uh, this idea that shows up in this latest movie, Transcendence, I haven't seen it yet. Have you? I just read reviews. No, the Johnny Depp movie. I haven't seen it. I heard it's, once again, not very good. Uh, yes, yeah, not very good. The, re the reviews sure were not favorable, but it, it's about uploading a human being's quote-unquote personality or consciousness into a computer, and that's a great science fiction theme. I don't think any practicing scientist has the least idea what that would mean or what that would entail. So AI, not on horizon, I think. Limited stuff, like a robot vacuum cleaner that does a pretty good job of picking its way around your furniture, we already have that. They have those, yeah. Those work. I just saw an article about robotic machines that somehow trundle up and down a barn where you keep cows, figure out when the cow is ready to be milked. I don't know how. I didn't read the article in enough detail. And goes ahead and milks it. So it's pretty phenomenal. And, and that kind of thing could make a huge revolution in agriculture. But you're a long way away from a general purpose intelligence like we've been seeing in the movies now for a long, long time. How about living forever? Instead of just creating androids, we use the people and uh, use technology and we live forever. 
I mean, parts just wear out. We just have to replace the ones that don't work, right? Right, or, or even better, if you and I are nothing but a collection of bits, we can just get reproduced over and over and over again. But it would take a lot of the fun out of life, right? Where would you put in the beer if you were locked up in a computer? <laughs> um, the transporter in Star Trek, that's how they sent uh, one guy to another place. Now, it wasn't actually Captain Kirk going from one place to another. It was the information. Exactly right. Yes, they, they disassembled him and reassembled him 100% accurately. How about that? Is that possible? Uh, it's possible. We're doing it now, but on the most limited scale you can imagine, one or two photons at a time or one or two atoms at a time. So you, you can actually read physics papers. When I first encountered this, it surprised me. You can actually read serious physics papers written by serious researchers, serious professors, that use the word teleportation. They're actually using that word. But what they're talking about is taking a photon and reproducing it exactly at a distant location. So it is what they do in Star Trek, but there's some reasons in quantum mechanics that say you'll never be able to do that with a really complex person or object. You just have too much information you need to copy. So it will probably stay at the level of just a few tiny microscopic objects, and that's it. Uh, it, to me, it's dubious that we'll ever get to the point of transporting even a mouse, let alone a person. One other thing about Star Trek, by the way, well, two things. I, I, I don't know if you know the story, and, and the listeners might like to hear it if, if they don't know it. When the show first started on TV, they didn't have very much of a budget. And part of the reason they used a transporter was it was simply cheaper to have people travel around that way and pay for the special effects it would take to show rocket rocket ships taking off and landing. And it became so embedded in the show that people actually now like it. They really want it to be there. And the other thing is, uh, even that form of teleportation is even more unbelievable because if you think about it, all they have is a transmitter. There's no receiver. Usually in the teleportation experiments I'm talking about where you send a photon from point A to point B, you have a transmitter at one end and a receiver at the other end. Star Trek doesn't even have a receiver. They just beam you down to the planet's surface, and there you are, no problem. So that's a highly advanced form of teleportation. I don't think we'll ever get to that particular version. But you have quantum entanglement, so it would perhaps somehow work with that. Yes, and, and that's what I was talking about when I talked about sending photons from point A to point B. That uses quantum entanglement. That's exactly right. It, it's the right physical phenomenon. But entanglement can't be extended to something as complex as billions and trillions of atoms and molecules. So that's what it comes down to. There's a theorem that you can't get enough information into the system to make that work. See, just like the economics of Star Trek, the economics of, say, uh, mining from other planets, you're, you're, like you're saying, you just can't send a guy out there and uh, they'll never get there and back in any reasonable amount of time. But if you could teleport, say, the gold from one planet to here, that would be good. That would, that would be extremely nice. I would invest in a company that could do that. I'd put a pretty penny into it. And I, there's at least one company that says they're going to start asteroid mining, but this will use conventional spacecraft as far as I know. They're not talking about anything more exotic than that. Uh, a lot of conspiracy theorists, they say a lot of things, but uh, one of the theories is that the government is capable of time travel and that they keep this information hidden from the public. Being a top-level physicist, do you think this is at all possible? Well, you know, they would have to know more about some brilliant scientists and the government would have to know more about the universe than all the rest of the scientists put together. So, you know, a conspiracy theory where, where what you're doing is maybe violating what's considered legal is one thing. A conspiracy theory that amounts to repealing the law of nature, well, that's a bit thick. That's a little more than I could ever begin to believe in. Hmm. Keeping with the Star Trek theme, in that show they had the Romulan Warbird. Yes, I know this stuff. They had an invisibility cloak. Yeah. Uh, and that makes me think of the uh, RoboCop police force as well. Invisible cops, invisible armies, invisible paratroopers coming down, and all of a sudden they're everywhere. That's closer to reality, than a lot closer to reality than, say, time travel. Um, this is one of the topics I covered in the book you mentioned, Slow Light, because I have a couple of chapters on invisibility. 
So invisibility has been achieved. I, I mean that literally. I could put a small object in front of you that would be there, and yet you could stare at it for an hour and swear there was nothing there. But so far limited to small objects, maybe something no bigger than a uh, coffee mug, and I'm probably even overstating that, maybe half the size of that. But it's been done. People have figured out ways to build an optical cloak. A good analogy, Russell, is to think of a stream of water. Let's say you're standing ankle deep in a stream and water's flowing down past you. Way upstream, maybe there's a rock. So the water flowed down, hit the rock, flowed around it and came back. If it flowed around the rock and came back to a nice smooth stream and I asked you, is there a rock upstream? You would say no because all you'd see would be that smooth current of water, nothing disturbed it. Now replace the flowing water with light rays and ask yourself, well, if the light rays come along, hit an object, bend around it, then rejoin and come along smoothly, your eye is fooled. Your eye says, and your, your eye and your brain say, there's no object up there. So that's how invisibility works. The limitation right now, as I said, is size. And also, no one's yet figured out a way to do it on a mobile object. These are for stationary things. In fact, as, since we talked about Canada a little bit, I will tell you that I researched the book. I actually found a Canadian military research analysis which addressed exactly the question you asked. Would it be worthwhile to try to think about making individual invisibility armor for soldiers or for bigger vehicles like tanks? And the conclusion was, even if you could do it, which again is questionable, probably the advantage wouldn't be nearly as great as you think. So that probably is not going to happen, but I think it could be doable at least for certain specific situations. That would be uh, incredible technology for a citizen to get their hands on. You would be you would be a god amongst men. That would be a good thing for the government to keep a tight lid on. I totally agree. Mm hmm. Are we living inside a simulation? I'm sure you've seen some of these headlines. And, of yeah, course, The yeah, Matrix the was Matrix. a popular movie. <laughs> yeah, The Matrix. And there's been a, uh, a physicist named, uh, a good theoretical physicist, a very good theoretical physicist named Max Tegmark, who's caused a stir among physicists because he's come out with some thoughts along the lines of the universe is really nothing but a mathematical theorem. Nothing physical involved there at all. It's all mathematics. There are other people who say the universe is all data. So these are different ways of saying that what we think is physical reality isn't really. It is a simulation of something or our minds are interpreting something in a way that is, that is not how they really are. I, I find these questions really intriguing, but also up, up to a point, not very illuminating. To me, there's a double answer. One answer is, if you can reach out and touch it, if that's what your body is telling you, why would you even worry about a simulation? This is the reality that our bodies accept and know how to work with and deal with. At a deeper level, it's all insane. So if I have a coffee cup in front of me. I'm looking at it. It seems to be a nice piece of black ceramic, nice and solid. If I could get my microscope powerful enough and could start probing into it, I'd see molecules, atoms, protons, neutrons, then all the way down to quarks uh, with mostly empty space between them. So what I'm holding in my hand is way different from what you see at a deeper reality. So you could argue it, it's all very strange if you think about it, and the right way to deal with it for day-to-day -day life is what you reach out is what's there. Also, I'm a physicist. Physicist has the word physics in it or physical, I tend to give physical things real weight. So I kind of do not play around much with the idea that we live in a simulation. I don't even quite know what it means or where it would get us to imagine that that's what we're doing. Well, do you think it's possible that we're creating our own realities? We think of something and it happens. Yes, at, 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 some, level, at some level we are. And, and the other example would be um, if you ask yourself, and this is one of the hardest questions in science. Um, what does it mean when you say we're humans are self-conscious? That is, we sit around and we reflect on ourselves. We have visions of our lives and the kind of people we are and how we were brought up and memories and, and all of that. Where does that come from? Well, if you're a spiritual person, you think there's something extra beyond just the 
atoms that make up our body, and that's what gives us our minds. If you're a materialistic, a materialist kind of person, not materialistic, but materialist, like a lot of scientists, you say, well, it all comes from the physical actions of the body. It's nothing but a, a electric circuits in your brain forming some kind of image of who you are and what you are. And somehow we build up an image of ourselves from that. To me, neither answer is very satisfying, but they're the best we have. And the second one really does say somehow we create a reality inside our heads about who we are, but we really do not understand that reality very well or where it comes from. So I agree with you. We do some reality creating all the time. It's limited by what our bodies can do and what our brains can do. But it's the only thing we have, so we go with it. I heard something. I'm not sure if it's true. I'm asking you. Um, okay. That the image that we have of ourself, of course, we look in the mirror and we see ourselves. But if they made a perfect clone, that we wouldn't recognize ourselves. Is that true? Oh, I've never heard that. It's quite interesting. Uh, I could see it because looking in the mirror, it's kind of a static image. If I saw someone walking around, I would know. I don't know what my own stance is like. I don't know how I carry myself. It might very well look strange to me. So yeah, I, I see some justice in that. I don't want there to be a clone of me, but and maybe I would rather not recognize him. Who knows? Well, Michio Kaku said, "Listen, everyone's worried about clones, but there are clones out there now. Have you not heard of identical twins? You know, they're clones." Um, we have some audience questions here. Uh, the Philadelphia experiment, we talked about transportation earlier, teleportation. Uh, did that really happen? I researched this for my book on invisibility, too, because it's been around a long time and I got very interested. Apparently, there was a, this is during World War II. Apparently, there was a destroyer being overhauled or outfitted in the Philadelphia Navy Yard in the 1940s while the war was going on that had a lot of electronic equipment added antennas, radar dishes, and whatnot. Somehow that got turned into... Oh, and, and then part of the story is it somehow disappeared one night from Philadelphia and reappeared the next day hundreds of miles away in Delaware or someplace else. Um, apparently that turned into a story that the Navy had discovered invisibility, hit the destroyer, made it invisible, and then made it visible again someplace else. Since we don't even have the technology today to do that, I'm really very dubious that it happened in the 1940s. But there's this great suspicion among the public that the government or the corporations that work with the government, the highest levels of secrecy, that their technology is 20, 30, 40, 50 years away from what we can imagine. Again, is this just paranoia? I, I wouldn't use that, that strong a word. Uh, it's very easy to think about very powerful entities, corporations with billions of dollars or governments doing things we don't know about, and they do do a lot of things we know about. But if you're making a judgment about science and technology, you kind of know what the best scientists in the world have come up with. There may be some better scientists somewhere, or great scientists have been bought off by a corporation or a government and made to hide their great breakthroughs. But I can't imagine there are many people like that. So just at a practical level, it's hard for me to see where these breakthroughs would come through when the mass of science says otherwise. But, you know, let's accept the fact that I'm a scientist and I tend to believe in what science tells me. Other people come from different directions and wouldn't accept the argument that I just made. I'm, I'm willing to accept that. But that's the argument I make. If someone has figured out a way to travel in time which would violate the theory of relativity, where is this great scientist, and why would he or she let themselves be bought off by the government or by a corporation that could get more fame and a dozen Nobel Prizes by revealing their fantastic research? What about Nikola Tesla? Now, he was a very interesting case. Very fascinating guy, clearly did some very, very brilliant things with electricity, is the reason that we have uh, AC voltage in our homes rather than DC voltage. He made breakthrough inventions in that area. And he had a lot of other great things about uh, electricity. He had ideas about a wireless transmission of power. Now, we already have wireless transmission since your smartphone and mine pick up signals from the air and our laptop computers do that and so on. But these are tiny amounts of power, microwatts of power. Tesla wanted to be able to transmit kilowatts and megawatts and gigawatts through the air. He 
built some facilities that he claimed to do that. As far as I know, there isn't any practical technology that would do that particular thing. And again, he worked in the 20s and 30s. We're now 50, 100 years beyond that. I don't think anyone's yet come up with, with a way to transmit really huge amounts of power through the air. So that particular area, I think maybe he didn't quite get right, although he wanted to. Other areas, he was a genius. He did great stuff. Not every scientist gets everything right. Einstein made some errors in the theory of relativity that had to be corrected later, too. Do you put Tesla on the level of Einstein, or is he lower? It's a different kind of science. He was more applied. So on, a, on the applied engineering level, he did a, it was a very high level. He really did brilliant, brilliant stuff. Kind of almost at the a level of Edison, maybe. But I, I wouldn't come... This is really apples and oranges. The, the theoretical guys and the experimental and applied guys are two different kinds of scientists. This is an email I received. Uh, okay. This is more of a philosophical question, I suppose, but also physics as well. So if you would like to ask uh, Professor Perkowitz what he thinks about the idea that we are living within a fractal reality. In other words, if we had both a telescope and a microscope with infinite zoom capability, would we see our own reality continue forever? That's a really interesting question. Uh, and, and the word fractal is, uh, I'm sorry, fractal is important there. Because one of the things about fractal in mathematics is it says if you have a certain shape at a certain scale, say you have uh, an Im a geometric image on a rug, and then you somehow could dive down inside that image on the rug with a powerful microscope, you keep seeing the, exactly the same shape. In other words, it replicate itself smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So what this uh, audience member is asking is, if we had a good enough microscope, could we look inside ourselves and keep seeing tinier and tinier, but absolutely perfect replicas of ourselves all the way down? My answer is a yes and a no. The no is we wouldn't see replicas of ourselves all the way down. But the yes is the further down you go, you still continue to see tinier and tinier things. I'll go back to what I said before. You could start with a human being put a microscope on a piece of his or her skin and begin to see the atoms that make us up, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, so on, connected in molecules, then focus down on the nucleus of an atom, like one of the oxygen atoms that would have protons and neutrons, focus down on the protons, you would see quarks, and so on. Until now, people have thought quarks are the smallest pieces of reality we can imagine, but there's now some talk about subquarks. So that implies an even more powerful microscope would let you look inside a quark and see something even smaller. So that's the yes part of my answer. I think the deeper you look, you will continue to see smaller things. That may never end, but there would not be replicas of anything, so I wouldn't quite call it fractal. But the opposite would not be true. You couldn't go outwards forever. Right. You could not go, and, and good, great point, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, you could not go outwards forever because we, as far as we know, the universe has a finite size. So you could go up to the limit of it, the edge of it, but as far as we know, not beyond that. Uh, another email here. Uh, please ask Sidney Perkowitz how long he thinks NASA's Voyager probe will last in space while being slowly bombarded by micrometeors. That is a great question, too, and, and it's relevant to a lot of stuff that's going on now. Maybe people remember that uh, last year and again just recently, a uh, piece of space debris, a space rock, came in and exploded over Siberia. So our solar system is full of little and big rocks flying around that hit planets and hit moons and can hit spacecraft. So this question is, since all the stuff is flying around, and we sent this Voyager spacecraft out. I think it's now been 30 or 35 years just flying straight out from our solar system. Would it not eventually be demolished by having a lot of these collisions? I think the answer is the damage is probably a lot less than you think. Uh, for one thing, this space debris is in our solar system. That's true, especially near the asteroids or wherever a comet is. But Voyager is now out beyond the edge of our solar system. It's way out beyond Pluto. It's heading into interstellar space. And although we're not exactly sure because we haven't been there, the thinking is that interstellar space is really pretty empty. One estimate I've seen is that if you took a cubic yard of space out there between galaxies, 
you would see one hydrogen atom. That's it. So the chance that there's a lot of space debris where it is now, it seems to me, is pretty slim. I think it would encounter very, very little, and I think it could probably fly for hundreds of thousands of years without getting severely damaged or even very, very much scarred up. The idea of the emptiness of space, that's, that's frightening in a way. It, isn't it? You know, it makes you realize what a tiny role humanity plays in the universe. Yeah. I, I'll just remind people who may not have this number at the top of their heads that the nearest star beside our sun is four light years away, which to put it in, in units that we all know, in miles is 24 trillion miles. If you took a, Na a NASA spacecraft right now at the speed at which those spacecraft can reach, it would take something like 30 or 40,000 years to cover that distance. And that's the nearest star. So it's really almost unimaginable how far away the more distant bodies are. And the human mind just can't cope with this very well. Infinite desert. Unbelievable. And I think that's why people really would love the idea of finding life elsewhere. It would make things a little less lonely. Do you think there are any humanoid-type species or extraterrestrials living within uh, the universe? Yes. I think, I think the evidence is just growing that it's very, very likely. I don't know that they'd be humanoid, but some kind of living thing. Mm -hmm. We're finding it's now up to four or 500 what they call exoplanets, planets outside our solar system. And uh, recently they found some that are more and more Earth-like. And that means they have conditions where uh, liquid water could exist. And that means that you could have the chemical reactions that we believe are responsible for life. So I think the evidence is mounting. There's every reason to think there's life somewhere else in the universe. It would be great as an old science fiction fan to actually see that happen. It wouldn't freak you out? Uh, well, you, you don't know what you'll encounter. You know, there are science fiction stories where they're benign, and science fiction stories where there are monsters who want to wipe out every one of us. So we'd have to take our chances, I guess. I'm not uh, having dinner on their spaceship, that's for sure. Uh, to serve man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a famous story. To yeah. serve man. Uh, a a follow-up uh, on the uh, Voyager probe question was, uh, they put a record into the uh, the probe. Uh, would that be in any condition to be played after traveling thousands and thousands of years in space? Yeah, that was Carl Sagan's idea, I think, to put, to, he put on a plaque and a record with some typical Earth music. I don't know if it actually was a record or a CD, I, but whichever one it was, of course, if it hit some micrometeorites, that would score up the track some. So I would think that probably would be a little more susceptible to damage than the rest of the Voyager. Well, when did they send out the Voyager? When did I send it out? I think it was 76. I'm in front of my computer. CDs came out, what, in the late 70s, 78 or something? Yeah, so I'm not sure it was a CD or a it's record. It's on the cusp would... of that technology, yeah. While we're talking, I'll see if I can look it up. So whichever one it is, uh, whether, it, whether it's an old-fashioned uh, vinyl record or a CD, you want to have the tracks in good shape. So getting hit by micrometeorites would do it no good whatsoever. Okay, it's been going for 36 years. That's what Google has just told me. So it might have overlapped with the beginning of CDs. One last question. Um... In your opinion, what's been the greatest scientific achievement in the past 30 years? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I think I put it in, in two areas. One is what you call hard technology, which would be lasers. Uh, they really changed the world in a lot of ways. It's a little more than 30 years. is about 55 years, but I put that in. And then that soft technology, which covers anything in biomedicine, so I think the discovery and beginning to apply stem cells is a huge, huge, huge deal. Not just for human health. One article I'm writing now is about the fact that if you try to project ahead, we're going to have almost 10 billion people on this planet in, uh, by 2050. And we do not have the capability, the resources, the agriculture to feed them. So people are thinking of different solutions. And one solution is to go in the lab start with stem cells from a cow and grow actual beef, but in the lab. It doesn't come off a slaughtered cow. It just comes from the cells from a cow. So that's one great example of how stem cells have 
a discovery that does have all kinds of ramifications, both for health but for other areas in human existence too. So those are the two I think I, I would name right offhand. The website, Sydney, where the audience can go and read more about what you do? SydneyPerkowitz.net. One word, SydneyPerkowitz.net. Sorry my name isn't shorter, but there you are. <laughs> uh, listen, this is a great book, Slow Light. It's really fun to read. And just like Universal Foam, it's shaping up to be just as good. Uh, it's been an awesome time. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you, Russell. Your questions were great, and the questions from the listeners were terrific, too. I hope I answered them or at least made them think a little bit. <laughs> you got an A-plus, Professor. Thank you very much. Take care, Russell.